Whether you're just starting out or looking to advance your career further, there's a lot of things that you need to consider. And it's more than just technical guidance. So I'll go through some of the best tips and proven strategies that help you advance your career, especially nowadays with the rise of AI, it's making it even more important that you're guiding your path in the correct direction. My name is Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. Probably one of the biggest things that a lot of people overlook is the fact that you need to be the captain of your own career. A lot of people look towards their managers or mentors to help give them guidance of where they need to go. But they're thinking about their own career and they're busy making sure that you're doing everything that you need to do, making sure they're winning the next work. So they don't really have time to manage your own career. Yes, you may seek advice from them, you may discuss with them, but it's up to you to make sure that you're being the captain of your career. So it means that you need to be taking control of your learning environment, your growth and your professional development. Checking off that you're working on the different projects that you wanna work on. So if you wanna get experience in timber, talking to your manager to see if you can get on a project designing for timber. If you wanna get experience in post-tensioning, making sure you're discussing that to try and tick off those areas. So you have gotta be looking at what type of projects am I working on? Am I getting experience in different areas? Is this helping me develop my career? So what technical aspects should I be focusing on? Looking at different professional activities that you can go to, to making sure you're getting those CPT points in the correct area. The one area that most people overlook, in addition to being the captain of your career, is looking at emotion control and communication control. They're some of your biggest assets that will help you advance quicker to get up to those higher levels. Everything we do every day is some form of communication. So whether you're talking to your mentor, whether you're talking to colleagues, or whether you're talking to other clients, it's really important you have good communication skills and tailoring your communication to the audience that's speaking to it. But a lot of time in communication, we can lose control by letting our emotions take control of ourselves. So what you want to do, as soon as you get that pang of where you want to respond straight away, taking a deep breath and thinking about it for a couple of seconds, and having your own control to see how you can respond in the correct way. Because just responding out of anger or spite will never lead to a good result. And when you think about people that have performed well in meetings, is that person that's responding quickly, just responding out of sheer action and not being really calm? Or is the person that's calm in the room that seems to have the best presence in that room? You also wanna reframe the way you're thinking about these things is turning around and going, can I put myself in their shoes? So what are they thinking? Why are they responding in this way? And why are they acting towards me in this way? Is it the fact that they're just thinking about something else? Are they being spiteful? Most of the time they're not. Why would you put something to malice that can potentially be just from incompetence or thinking about something else? By framing it in this way, you'll lead to a better working relationship and more thoroughly push the project forward faster. The better you can communicate and the better you can control your emotions and the better you can respond to people, the more likely you are to get those next positions that you're looking for. Most people don't do this and this is where the biggest paychecks will come in. Having your communication skills in check and having your emotions in check, it is important that you maintain your technical skills as that's really what you're doing as a profession. That's really what people pay you for. It's about solving their problems, but it's about having strong technical skills. So being able to understand how you should analyze something. What is the principles of FEA? What's the principles of using the software that you're using? What are the, some of the limitations of that software? What are some of the benefits? How can you approach things in a different way? Can you do that check by hand? Can you double check that the software is producing a similar result? What you don't want to be doing is relying on the software for your answers where you don't know whether it's right or wrong. Don't treat it like a black box. Treat it like a tool that helps you get to the right answers. If you don't understand something thoroughly, something that I like to do is write either my own program or my own Excel sheet to help me analyze and how it actually works. And this gets me a better understanding of the mechanics behind it and some of the things I'm expecting. So it means that you can have different cross links that you haven't thought about before. One of the biggest things is the making sure that you should be spending most of your time improving your analytical skills. Just because you're out of university doesn't mean you haven't learned everything that you need to learn. There's still so much to learn and you'll find that even five, 20 years out, you're still learning things. It means that you're on the right path. Something that we just talked about is that constant learning. It's something that's really important, making sure that you're focusing your learning on where you need it to be. Now, it doesn't need to be necessarily need to be taking courses. You might be watching YouTube videos like you are today. It could be reaching out to other people that you want to just have a discussion about a design. You could be doing your own self-learning where you're trying to design from first principles. You're buying some books and you're getting better education from them. Now, what you also want to do is making sure that you're not just learning, you're moving that knowledge from 
new learning into knowledge. So what does that mean? It means actually applying it. And after you do that, you can potentially reach out to other people and even have a brainstorming session. A lot of the time, it's really great to have a brainstorming session, but what does that mean? It means that you need to have answers there. You need to have solutions that you think that this is the way it's going to happen and have that discussion. Reaching out to other people and colleagues can help you have a lot of learning from what, how they're thinking about it, how you're thinking about it, and have that discussion to making sure that you're moving that short-term knowledge into long-term knowledge and long-term gains. And you also want to make sure that sometimes you do need to have those courses which are a little bit more structured. That means that you can understand stuff in a little bit more detail about someone who is more advanced than you are. They've thought about this is the critical stuff that you need to know and this is how I think about it. Just because you take that course doesn't mean you need to take it as gospel either. A lot of times there's many ways to approach different designs and that's just one path, but it does give you another chip in the belt about how you should be thinking about things. As you're advancing your career further, we talked about a little bit about communication, but communication is probably one of your most critical things that you need to know. It's about how you communicate to different people who inspire them to make sure they're going along the path that you want them to. It's not necessarily pushing them or forcing them or making them do something, but making them understand about why you're thinking about something a certain way and how potentially they could approach a design or how potentially they could approach advancing something. So you're trying to talk to them about, this is what I'm thinking about, but offering insights about how do you think about this? Offering, looking for feedback from other team members. So you're looking and seeking for other knowledge. Running effective meetings is also something that's really critical. And I would recommend that you look at different ways to run meetings. Because a lot of time we have big meetings with lots of people in them. It's really not effective. You only really a couple of people contribute. So what's the point of having all those additional people in that meeting? Some of the best meetings that I find, especially when you're on projects, is where the project manager has gone in and just said, okay, I need these people, these people, these people. So what people need to be involved in which parts? The people that need to be involved in more parts, they have their contribution at the end. But the people that potentially only need to focus on one area don't really care about the rest. Well, typically at first, it means that halfway through that meeting, they can leave. What's also great is to have some sort of briefing before that meeting, making sure that they're prepared. So having some sort of information, something like you would in Amazon, where they've got this little brief memo that people can read before the meeting starts. So you start the meeting, people read the memo, and then they have a better understanding and then they can think about a little bit more about the questions that they may be asking. And a lot of the time, you also want to be one of the last people to speak in that meeting as you want the younger and more junior staff to put their thoughts forward. Now, sometimes if you bring your thoughts forward, they may not be willing or may have a counteractive idea that they don't think they need to contribute anymore because you've approached it in a different way. And just because you've approached it in one way doesn't mean it's correct. So a lot of the time, you can miss a lot of good insights by being the first to speak doesn't matter what stage of your career you're in. You should always time for networking as you never know when you need those contacts. It's even better to be starting out earlier. So when you're first starting out is having those contacts with other clients, potentially other architects, other builders, make sure you're maintaining your network, reaching out every now and then. If you move later in your career, that's where they become even more important. Now, if you build up over many years, this relationship, when they start to get into higher positions where they can give you work, you can work together. This is really where you become what is the breadwinner or the money winner in the project. And that's really where you can get those next step ups. And that's what you need to do later in your career. If you're trying to build those relationships up later, it makes it harder and harder and harder. Having those people that you trust that you can bounce ideas off is more than invaluable. It's actually a key asset to helping you progress your career faster. Another one that I highly recommend is moving outside the box of your standard designs, looking for creative solutions or ways that you can problem solve something. Not just thinking about this is how we solve something, sticking it in the same way as anyone can do that. And it typically doesn't lead to innovation, typically doesn't lead to better designs. It doesn't typically lead to better architecture. So looking at different problems about how you can potentially solve things in different ways, looking for innovative solutions, looking for different load paths, looking for different ways to solve the same problem and not just sticking to the same answer. Just because they have a column in one location doesn't mean that you can't suggest having a column in a different location. The innovative solutions will what will bring the client to you the next time. So look, I had Brendan, he had a design, he came up with an innovative solution that allowed me to achieve the design that I wanted. Where if they're going to another an engineer that may not have come up with an innovative solution, it doesn't really bode well for them. And if you don't flex this muscle over time, you can lose it. So it's something that you need to keep going. Engineers don't really get known for being creative. But if we look back in the day, when we're talking about some of the great engineers of the past, especially in Italy, they were both creative and engineers. And look at the masterpieces that they got to produce. Something that you should also look at, depending whether you're four, five, six years out, you should definitely be looking at enhancing your qualification. So looking for that ISTRUCK D certification that I recommend everyone to take. In the US, that would be PE, which is very equivalent. You have to do this hard exam. 
They're looking to get certification so that you can sign off on buildings. A lot of people get scared. You know, oh my God, I'm the one that's signing off on building. It doesn't really matter if someone else is signing on off it. It's still your responsibility. People can miss things. So you're not relying on other people that are signing off to make sure they're checking it correctly. So whether you're designing specifically or signing it off, it doesn't really matter. You're still responsible and that's how I take it. But if you are signing it off, it means that you can look at progressing your career further. You can look at taking a little bit more responsibility with that people are looking for. It also makes sure, especially with things like the PE or the ISTROC D certification, you can have faith in the what knowledge you have. So it gives you better confidence that you know what you're doing. It doesn't mean you'll pass it the first time, but it does mean there's a great lot of learning, especially putting the materials together to pass such an exam. But don't forget that you'll want to have a lifelong career as well. So making sure that you will need to balance sometimes work-life balance. Sometimes you will need to stay up late to get those projects out. Sometimes you'll be a one night, two a.m. time to try and finish a certain project. You have those deadlines that you need to hit, but you don't need to do that every single day. And keeping fit, there's nothing better than producing your long-term knowledge by keeping your fitness up. Everyone wants to push their career further and faster, quicker. And I've got a link to a video here about the 10 traits that every successful engineer needs to have. And I'd just like to give a quick shout out to Chris Foster, one of my newest Patreon members. Without the support of my other Patreon and YouTube members, this type of content would not be possible. As always, keep learning and keep it up, and I hope to see you next week. Bye.